And this evening to our study of Matthew. Um, I hope y'all have been enjoying um, our Life of Christ study. Um, I know I have enjoyed it. And also uh, God have used this study to uh, help me grow as well. So I am growing with you. And I, I pray that this Matthew study, have the Life of Christ study, have been a blessing to you as it have me. Um, tonight, um, we're going to get halfway through the this book. We may end up finishing it tonight. And then again, uh, there may be just a couple uh, closing remarks on um, Thursday. But I want to thank you guys for um, uh, hanging in there and uh, going through this study uh, with us. Um, and also just uh, an announcement. I don't know exactly uh, when we're going to make this transition, but uh, we're going to start holding a uh, Tuesday night uh, Bible study here at Grace Bible uh, Ministry here in Washington. Um, and so at seven, I think six o'clock to seven o'clock on Tuesday, uh, either the first or the second week of August, uh, we're going to have a uh, a Bible study here, and probably the first week of August, we'll still do our 4.30 uh, Washington time, 6.30 Eastern, uh, 7.30, uh, no, 7.30 Eastern, and then 6.30 Central time Bible study, but uh, uh, the second Tuesday of August probably be our last um, Tuesday uh, uh, night study, but we'll still do our online study, but we'll still do our Thursday night study, still same time as we are meeting right now. Um, but you guys are welcome. I know it'd be a little late for you guys on uh, and on the East Coast uh, and Central Time. It'd be a little late for you to join us because it'll be um uh let's see it'll be three hours we start here at six it'll be nine o'clock your time and many of you probably already be in the bed but starting the second week of um august uh the tuesday bible study will go to um uh, nine o'clock eastern eight o'clock central and six o'clock Pacific time because we're doing a uh, Bible study at our church here, uh, Grace Bible Ministry. We still meet at 4.30 on Thursdays, uh, but the Tuesday time is going to change. And also the Tuesday study is going to be different from the Thursday study uh, starting the second week um, of August. So if you guys have any other question concerning that, uh, you got my phone number, 615-585-9609. So thank y'all for joining in, if you will. Uh, open your Bibles to Matthew 27, uh, starting at verse, uh, actually, let's go to Matthew 20, verse 18 and 19. We're continuing our life of Christ study. We're currently in Matthew 27, verse 27, but in preparation for our study tonight, I want you to go to Matthew 20, verse 18 and 19. Matthew 20, verse 18 and 19. Matthew chapter 20, verse 18 and 19. And what we have been looking at uh, in our class, our last class is how Jesus was being abused. Um, and we also was introduced to his crucifixion. And tonight we're going to be looking at his resurrection and also his commission uh, to his disciples um, after his resurrection. But in preparation for our study tonight, we're going to Matthew 20, uh, verse 18 and 19. And in Matthew 20, Verse 18 and 19, we see Jesus prophesying of his future abuse 
uh, and his crucifixion at the hands of Gentiles and also Jews. Matthew 20, verse 18 and 19 is going to prepare our study for tonight. So verse 18 and 19 of Matthew 20 reads, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem. This is Jesus speaking. And the Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death and would hand him over to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and crucify him. And on the third day, he will be raised up. So here, our Lord Jesus Christ is uh, giving prophecy concerning his death, uh, his crucifixion, his mistreatment and abuse at the hands of Gentile, and also he's foretelling his resurrection. Now, if you go now to our current study for the night, in Matthew 27, um, starting at verse 27, we see a partial fulfillment of that prophecy that we just read. So let's go to our text for tonight. Let's go to Matthew 27, starting at verse 27. And verse 27 uh, begins, Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole Roman cohort around him. So here in verse 27 of Matthew 27, we see troops of about 600 men gathered in the common hall or courtyard of the governor's uh, official residence in Jerusalem. Now this resident uh, was either the fortress of was probably the fortress of, of uh, Antonia uh, built by Herod at the west side of the city. So these troops all gathered and they gathered uh, about 600 troops gathered to ab abuse Jesus uh, through mocking and mistreatment. They were ignorant though that the king of the Jew was the one who they were mocking and mistreating. Now notice verse 28. Uh, they stripped him of his clothes and they put on him a scarlet robe. So they undressed Jesus and they put a scarlet robe on him. Uh, and this scarlet robe was an attire of Roman civil official. And it was a way that they, uh, they, they, they mocked uh, him. And, and most of the time when a person had a scarlet robe on, it was the raw purple robe and uh, uh, civil official and important people wore this robe, but they were mocking him as a false king. They were saying that he was a false king. Uh, they were treating him as a false king and Messiah. Uh, the thing though that uh, uh, they were mocking him to be was actually true. It is actually who he was. They're mocking him uh, here, but uh, he is the king, even though they're mocking him as a false king and a false messiah, uh, he was actually what they were mocking him um, to be. He was the king of the Jews and he was their messiah. Verse 29, and after twisting together a crown of thorn, they put it on his head. So they twist together a crown of thorn and it, it until it resembled a circle wreath uh, and they put this circle wreath on him with thorns now this was a uh, cheap and painful imitation of the circle uh, uh, um, uh, wreath that is around Tiberius Caesar head made out of palm branches on the corn the Roman corn and so they were making fun of him they put a a crown of thorns, a wreath of thorns around his head, making fun of him. And, and then it say they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand. Now, the reed in his right hand was kind of like a scepter um, in the emperor's hand, uh, which is depicted on the back of corn. Uh, they then knelt down before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Verse 30, they spit on him, 
took the reed and began to beat him continuously on his head. After they had mocked him, they took the scarlet robe off him and put his own garments back on him and led him away to be crucified. In verse 32, they force uh, this poor man um, to uh, help Jesus bear his uh, cross. It said, as they were coming out, they found a man of Cyrene named Simon, who they pressed into service to bear his cross. Simon Musk was a Jew, but they forced this man to help Jesus bear this cross beam. One of the things that I wanted to note is how as they the soldiers mistreated Jesus, uh, his great humility, you know, I could not help but see that he demonstrated great humility even in the midst of being mistreated which is an example to all of us on how we're to deal with being mistreated by others when we have done nothing wrong. You know, this remind me, his humility here, what would demonstrate humility is he did not retaliate being mistreated uh, because if he did, that probably would disqualify him from being the savior of the world. All right, and but uh, uh, he did not um, uh, retaliate or respond to mistreatment as an example. It was an example to us that we're to remain obedient to God, even in the midst of being mistreated and treated wrongly. We're never to act out of character because of mistreatment, but to remain faithful and committed to obedience to God. This reminded me of First Peter chapter 2. Verse 23 through chapter 3, verse 2. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 2, 23 through chapter 3, verse 2. Let's go there. And could I get a volunteer to read when you get there, please? Ethan, give me the verses again and I'll read them. Okay, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 23 through chapter 3, verse 2. Okay, verse 23 says, 1 Peter 2, verse 23, And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds we were healed. For you were continually straying like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. In the same way, you wives be submissive to your own husbands, so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be one without a word by, by the behavior of their wives, as they observe your chaste and respectful behavior. And let not your adornment be merely external, braiding the hair and wearing gold jewelry or putting on dresses, but let it be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. For in this way, in former times, the holy women also who hoped in God used to be a, used to adorn themselves, being submissive to their own husbands. All right, stop right there, Johnny. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for going to verse five. Um, but what I wanted to bring out is how the humility that Jesus displayed when he was mistreated. Um, he remain faithful to the plan of God, even in the midst of mistreatment, which shows great humility. It say that he called us for that to this purpose, uh, saying Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his step, who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. 
While being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threat. But here's the kicker. But he kept entrusting himself to him who judges right righteously. And then when he go down, he say in the same way. So in the same way. So he ties this in with, I mean, Peter ties this in um, with the respect that wives are to have for their husband. Because uh, at times you may have a wives or married women, Christian women may have a husband who's not yet a believer. He may not be a believer or a husband who's a believer, but living in carnality. And therefore he may be treating his wife in a unloving way. He, he, he may not be living according to the principles of the word of God. Uh, uh, but here wives are, are to give unconditional respect to their husband and, and knowing that God rejects sin and would judge wrong. He don't need our help when we're being mistreated. He don't need our help. You know, he wants the wife to be respectful, even to the carnal or uh, unbelieving husband. Uh, because our obedience to God should never be conditioned on someone else's obedience to God. Our obedience to God should never be conditioned on our obedience to God. You know, uh, you know, some people uh, say, you know what, I'm not going to respect my husband. He got to earn that. He got to deserve that. He's not going to get my respect <laughs> until he earned it. In other words, until he show me more love, then I'm going to be obedient to God. You see what you're saying? I mean, or whoever, the, the, the woman that say, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to respect him until he obedient to me. Well, the scripture is showing him that our respect should be unconditional. It should not be conditioned on your husband being obedient to God. And if he's an unbeliever, he got to get saved first. And if he's a believer, God don't need our help. God is just, he would deal with any wrong that is done to his children. So when the wife is respectful and obedient to her, uh, respectful to her husband in obedience to God, unconditional obedience to God, then God is behind the scene working things out and dealing with the husband, but he don't need our help. But what happened here, a lot of time we try to help God. We try to help God when we're being mistreated by retaliating, by retaliating. Jesus Christ is our example of humility and obedience to God in the midst of unjust treatment. When we are wronged by others, we are not to retaliate because if we retaliate, it is a form of pride and arrogance if we do and disobey uh, God's word, it is a form of pride. And it also demonstrates lack of faith. It demonstrates lack of faith. When a wife disrespects her husband and, and, and because he is not being unloving, then that is not her trust in God. And it is a form of arrogance. Respect to a disobedient Christian husband or unbelieving husband is an act of faith and obedience. Jesus was demonstrating faith and obedience when they were mistreating him. And yet he didn't say anything. He didn't retaliate. And he was trusting in his father. He knew the end of the story. He knew that God, the father is just, he knew it. And, and we have to apply that when we're being mistreated. I'm talking to myself as well, because anytime I retaliate to a wrong done to me, I'm not trusting God. Not that I'm to wish anything bad on the person mistreat me, but I'm to remain obedient to God and not retaliate, which is demonstrating my faith. So, and, and one thing I have found out, you know, uh, is that disrespect, if my wife disrespect me, you know, that is not going to make me do anything, <laughs> Actually, it, it's the other way around. It actually makes me shut down. 
it makes me shut down when I don't get that respect from her. But a lot of time, you know, women think that disrespecting their husband is going to make him love them, uh, love her more. But a lot of time it ends up going the other way around. Uh, and so we don't really accomplish anything. When we disrespect uh, the husband uh, uh, when he's being unloving or carnal. See, our Lord Jesus Christ did not threaten or sin at all when these soldiers treated him this way. Realizing that God is just, he rejects sin and wrong. He would deal with it, but we are to be obedient to God no, no matter what. The very person that came to die for them, let's go back to Matthew 27. The very person that came to die for them. Jesus came to die for these Gentiles that is mistreating him and ridiculing him and beating him on top of the head, abusing him. He came to die for them. He came to be a blessing to them. And what they're doing, what are, what are their return? They're abusing and treating him badly. You know, shame on me if I retaliate to a wrong done to me by those that I have God have used me to be a blessing to. Jesus Christ did not do it. My obedience to God should never be conditioned on how others treat me. And Christ is my example of humility instead of pride is that I am to be gracious. I am to bless. I am to be obedient to God, no matter the mistreatment. And guess what? None of us can do it in our own strength, in our own power. We can't do that. We cannot do it. And that's why we have to meditate on this truth, the word of God, uh, so that the word, the spirit can take the word and enable us to do what we cannot do on our own. And, and once we know the word of God, the issue now and the challenge is us to submit to the authority of God's word. That's what we have to do in obedience, no matter the, how we're being treated, no matter what. So here we see sinners at their worst. We see sinners at their worst. We, are, are, we all are like this too. We may judge the Gentile soldiers and how they're treating Jesus, but guess what? We're like this too at times. We, we mistreat the very people sent to be a blessing to us all the time. But a true servant of God don't respond to mistreatment even from those that he's been a blessing to. He remained obedient to God. He don't act out of character. He don't respond to allow people to lower him to their level just because of their mistreatment. He actually continued to submit to God in turn makes him show unconditional love toward those who have mistreated him. And that is what our Lord Jesus Christ is doing as he's being mistreated by these soldiers. He's showing unconditional love because he is remaining obedient to the Father so that he can go to the cross and provide salvation for these very men that is mistreating him. Wow, what great humility and love uh, here uh, in Jesus' response to being mistreated. And he is our example on how we handle mistreatment. All right, let's go to verse 33 of Matthew 27. And now we get into the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew 27, verse um, um, 33. Verse 33 say, and when they came to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of a skull, they gave him wine to drink mixed with gale, and after tasting it, he was unwilling to drink it. So some women gave Jesus some wine to drink, mixed with mirth, and it was bitter. Now, it was a Jewish custom to mix myrrh with wine to ease a person's uh, uh, pain. But notice Jesus was unwilling to drink it. And, and it is my belief that he rejected it because he wanted to bear the full force of suffering as uh, 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 for our sins. 
Um, and and in those times, a man about to be executed could beg for incense or narcotic and wine in order to dull his senses and alleviate his pain. But our Lord Jesus Christ refused it. He didn't. He he refused alleviating the pain of his suffering. He wanted to feel it all, and 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 and, and what a and it was all because of his love for us. And then we we go on, uh, and, and I want you to notice something else that our Lord Jesus Christ could have saved himself from all this, but he didn't. In verse thirty five, say when they had crucified him. They divided up his garments among themselves by casting lot. See, uh, soldiers were entitled uh, to the criminal uh, clothes, and now they're all bidding for Jesus' clothes. Verse 36, and sitting down, they began to keep watch over him there. So keep watch. They didn't want anybody to rescue Jesus from the cross, so they sought there to keep watch. 37, and above his head, they put up the chart against him, which read, this is the king of the Jew. Now, this was uh, uh, an insult. They really did not uh, accept him as the king of the Jew. They were uh, still mocking, mocking him. Verse 38, at that time, two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right, one on the left. And those passing by were hurling abuse at him, wagging their head. So here he is also being abused even more. He's being abused by the Jews as well. And though passing by and saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild in three days, save yourself. If you are the son of God, come down from the cross. Well, Jesus could have came down from the cross, but if he came down or abandoned, I mean, if he abandoned the cross or came down from the cross, uh, then he would not be able to provide salvation for man. Man could not be saved, but he chose to be there on the cross. In the same way, the chief priest also, along with the scribes and the elder, were mocking him and saying, he saved others, he could not save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him now come down from the cross and we will believe on him. Now he could have did that, but if he would have did that, he could not have provided salvation for the world. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him if he delights in him. For he said, I am the son of God. The robbers who had been crucified with him were also insulting him with the same word. Now from the sixth hour, darkness fell upon all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out, and a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So at that moment, moment, we see Christ feeling abandonment on the cross, a spiritual abandonment, because at that moment, all the sins of the world was being poured on Jesus and being judged. And the father have temporarily separated himself from Jesus. And he sensed that temporary uh, 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 separation and, and, and then in verse 47, and some of those who were standing there when they heard it began saying, this man is calling for Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and taken a sponge. He filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave him a drink. But the rest of them said, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried again with a loud voice and he yielded up his spirit. Now let's, let me mention verse 50 again. It say he yielded up his spirit. So in other words, Jesus had control over his own death. No one took his life from him, from uh, him. He actually willingly gave his life for us. No one took his life away from him. Verse 51, it say, and behold, the veil of the temple were torn in two from top to bottom and the earth shook and the rock was split. The tombs were open and men and body of the saint had fallen asleep were raised and coming out of the tomb after his resurrection, they entered the holy city and appeared to many. Now I want you to notice the supernatural miracles that took place 
after Jesus' death and crucifixion. Many miracles took place. The first miracle we see uh, took place in the veil of the temple were torn from top to bottom. Why was it, what was the, the, the significance of the veil that stood over the 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 holy the holy place the holies of holy why was it important that the veil be torn from top to bottom and not from the bottom to the top see it's easier to tear something from the bottom but to tear something from the top it takes supernatural power to do that and so that's why that was a possible. I mean, it was, was so significant because a tear from the top to bottom was supernatural. It was a miracle. Now, what also the tearing of the veil show, it showed that the Mosaic law, because remember, through that veil, there is the Mosaic law in the Ark of the Covenant. The Mosaic law is in the Ark of the Covenant. Okay. And, but the veil being torn showed that the law that the the Jesus did brought an end to the Mosaic law. See, the law demanded obedience, and if man broke the law, then he would experience death. And all the Jew will honor the sentence of death because they all had broken the law. But now Jesus did away with the law and he brought in a new covenant of grace and love. That's what the tearing of the veil represent. Doing away of the law and bringing in a new age of grace and love. In other words, salvation is offered to all through simply believing. Forgiveness is now offered through grace and love of God. And then you read, read on. Another uh, supernatural miracle was the earth quake, uh, quake. The rocks were split. Um, the tomb were open, and many bodies of saints had fallen asleep were raised. In other words, believers resurrected. Uh, and this is probably where Old Testament saints had been uh, resurrected. And kind of coming out of the tomb after his resurrection, they entered the holy city and appeared to many. Look at verse 24, 54. Now the centurion and those who were with him keeping guard over Jesus, when they saw the earthquake and the thing that would happen and became frightened and said, truly, this was the son of God. Uh, in other words, this was no business as usual. Uh, this was no ordinary crucifixion. So the soldier realized that this is not no ordinary crucifixion here this is not business as usual during their crucifixion and crucifying criminal there is something special about this man this is not business as usual and then 55 and i think many of them became believers um through when they saw these miraculous uh, uh, uh miracles taking place 55 Men and women were there looking on from a distance who had followed Jesus from Galilee while ministering to him. Among them was Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Joseph and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. Now, I want you to notice that all his other disciples had abandoned Jesus and nobody's there but the women's and John. They're the only one that were there at Jesus' crucifixion. Everybody else have abandoned him just as Jesus said would happen. All right, let's go to verse 57. In verse 57, when it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who himself had also become a disciple of Jesus. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be given to him. And Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewed out in the rock. And he rolled a large stone against the entrance of the tomb and he went away. 
And Mary Magdalene was there and the other Mary sitting opposite the grave. Now on the next day, the day after the preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisee gathered together with Pilate and said, sir, we remember that when he was still alive, that the deceiver said, after three days, I am to rise again. Therefore, give orders for the grave to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciple may come and steal him away and say to the people, he has risen from the dead and the last deception will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, you have a guard, go make it as secure as you know how. In other words, I'm not going to give you any of my soldiers to go and secure uh, the tomb. Uh, you, you got soldiers, you take the temple guards and you go and secure the tomb because I'm not going to give my soldiers to do it. And then we read on. Um, uh, and they went and made the grave secure. And along with the guard, they set a seal on the stone. All right. Now, chapter 28, starting at verse 1. Verse 1 said, Now, after the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the grave. And behold, a severe earthquake had occurred. For the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. And his appearance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. The guard shook. The guard shook for fear of him and became like dead men. The angel said to the woman, do not be afraid. For I know that you are looking for Jesus who has been crucified. He is not here for he has risen. Just as he said, come see the place where he was lying. Go quickly and tell his disciple that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. All right. So here Jesus uh, have resurrected. Now, why the resurrection is so important? Well, the resurrection is so important because it authenticate that Jesus, who he said he was, and that his ministry was true, it validate all the prophecy. And as he prophesied earlier in Matthew 26, 32, that he will meet his disciples in Galilee. And, and in Galilee, he's going to give them instruction and a mission. And then verse 9. And behold, Jesus met them and greeted them, and they came up and took hold of his feet and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and take word to my brethren to leave for Galilee, and there they will see me. Now, while they were on their way, some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priest all that had happened. So the guards came and, and told the chief priest all that has happened. And what they're going to do, verse 17, when they saw him, they worshiped him. With some, well, actually, let me go back. I just missed my spot. Verse 12. And when they had assembled with the elders and they consulted together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldier and said, you are to, you are to say his disciple came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. So here they paid the soldiers to lie about the empty tomb. Uh, 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 they gave them money to spread lies about the empty tomb. Jesus had resurrected, but they paid him money to lie. Now we go and say, if this should come to the governor's ear, we will win him over and keep you out of trouble. And they took the money and did as they had been instructed. And this story was widely spread among the Jew, and it is to this day. Verse 16, but the 11 disciples proceeded to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had designated. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some were still hesitant. They were still hesitant and doubtful. And Jesus came up and spoke to them saying, now he's going to, now he's going to commission his disciple, give them his word, and he's going to give them a mission because he's about to ascend back to heaven. 
They were to make disciples of all people groups of the world. See, Christ is going to say in verse 18 that I possess all authority and I'm going to give you delegated authority so that you may make disciples of all the nation. He say, verse 18, and Jesus came up and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciple of all the nation. So here Jesus said, I got all authority. I'm going to share this authority with you, my disciples. And I want you to go to all the people groups of the world and make disciples out of them, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So the commission to the disciple is to go, verse 19. In other words, evangelize. He wants them to evangelize, share the good news with all people groups, not just be selected. Don't be selective or who you will share the gospel with. But go therefore to all, go evangelize and make disciples. And then he say, baptize in them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then after they come into faith, now what you're to do, once they respond to the gospel, now what you're to do, verse 20, teach them to observe all that I command you. Now it's time to Teach them to be obedient. Teach new converts to be obedient to the word of God because it's to obedience to the word of God that new converts submit to Jesus as Lord of their lives. So they're to come into salvation, but after salvation, new convert is to be taught to be obedient. When we gather in church every Sunday, we're already saved, but we gather to be taught to be obedient to Jesus Christ, to the word of God, so that we can mature, so that we can live our life under the authority of Jesus Christ. See, Jesus is already Lord. He already possesses all authority. But in our everyday life, through our obedience, we submit to him as our authority, as our Lord. And that is the great commission. Evangelize, and after new convert believe, now we're to teach them to be obedient to the principle of the word of God so that in their lifestyle, they can allow Jesus to be Lord of their lives, submitted to his authority in obedience. That is the great commission. And that is where the church kind of fell at. The church fell, you know, in evangelism. The church fell after evangelism, teach new convert the word of God always emphasizing obedience to the principles of the word so that in turn, the new convert can now grow and they too can participate in the great commission, share the gospel that saved them with others, and then encourage a new convert to become students of the word so they can be taught to be obedient and allow Jesus to be Lord of their life. This is the church mission. This is the church mission. The church is made up of all people who believe in Jesus Christ and all that follow his teaching. That is the church. Now, the kingdom have been rejected by Israel as a nation. The king postponed the kingdom. And now he gives the kingdom to his church. And at the present time in history and to the end of the tribulation period, the kingdom is being offered to Gentiles, but Jews also is being saved. And so my encouragement to everyone on tonight is that as Jesus commissioned his disciple, he commissioned you as well today to go make disciple of all people. Share your faith with everybody you come in contact with that don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, their savior. But the first thing we must do is make sure that we're being obedient to our Lord in our everyday life. And that's going to win us an opportunity to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with unsaved people. Because we win our right to be heard 
when people see our life is conforming to the principles of the word of God, and then they notice something is different about those people. And then when they ask us, what's the secret to you being different? It is through my faith in Jesus Christ, and it is through the word of God. And now we can bring them to faith and encourage them to study the word of God. That is all of our mission as believers in Jesus Christ, as we wait the rapture. And I encourage you in your own study, read the gospel of Acts, because we see the disciple carrying out this mission and God's power in the book of Acts. Let us close in prayer. Father, we're just so grateful for the study of Matthew. Uh, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to bear witness of these truths that we have learned in the book of Matthew. And Father, enable us through your spirit and power to be obedient so that we can win our right to be heard by the lost and dying world. And Father, we thank you for this study and all you have taught us and um, pray that you will keep our minds and heart until we meet again. When we come back uh, on Thursday, I want to conclude. We're done with Matthew, but this uh, I have a special uh, conclusion of our study of Matthew, and we're going to talk about uh, uh, missions, uh, evangelism, uh, missions, and discipleship to conclude uh, this class in Matthew. All right. Well, thank y'all so much for joining in uh, this evening. Uh, any questions or comments? Uh, Sister Linda, we're so happy to have you back. Thank God you recovered uh, from your surgery. We're glad to have you back. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Oh, uh, you're welcome. Well, God bless you, God. We'll see you on next Thursday, Lord willing. God bless you too. Good to see you, Linda.